On this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we're visiting with Damian Riffle. Damian has been chasing whitetails for a lifetime and has a wall and stories to show for it. Join along as he shows us his home and shares some of his favorite memories. If you're glad we're back, hit that like button and leave a comment on what you thought of the episode. The Exodus team is traveling around the United States to take a look inside the trophy rooms of some of the most interesting whitetail hunters in the country. From giant bucks, unique racks, and riveting stories, welcome to Whitetail Cribs. How you doing? Come on in. I'm Damien Riffle, this is my wife Dana, and this is our home. I'm a project coordinator for a communications company and I have a uh, small barbecue business where we travel around doing uh, national rib burnoffs and uh, love deer hunting and all types of hunting honestly. So this is our kitchen, just remodeled the entire house when we bought it or most of the house. Every winter we do uh, a new project, um, pretty much have the whole house done now except for our master bed bathroom. So it's our living room, big vaulted ceilings. We'll go upstairs, check out the office. So this is my uh, office here. This is my first deer or first buck that I've uh, killed when I was uh, back in 1992, I believe it was. Seven point, was shot him with a crossbow. Was pretty excited. Tried to uh, surprise my dad with it. I gutted it on my own and uh, walked couple hundred yards to where he was hunting and I walked up to him and he goes oh you got one did you and I didn't know how he knew it but I had blood all over me head to toe and uh, <laughs> I didn't hide it very good so I was pretty excited then uh, my uh, turkey fan display that I built uh, made it out of barn wood um, I actually made it to hold double the amount of beards that it had but I made the mistake of leaving my beards unattended and uh, my dogs decided to eat <laughs> more than half of them. <laughs> this here is uh, a giant uh, set of sheds that I just absolutely love with the curled out beam here. Put them on a mountain mic replica skull. Just a, an awesome deer. Um, that deer disappeared. The neighbor, the this year the neighbor shot him in the shoulder and nobody else saw him um, and then found these sheds in the spring. The deer was never seen that fall so not sure what ever happened to him here. So. Um, this is, uh, my wife's first buck with a compound bow, 165 inch giant buck. Um, the guy that scored it was a, uh, writer for, uh, Buckmaster magazine. And he wrote an article about the deer and, uh, shared some photos of it. So it was pretty cool experience for being her first buck with a compound. So next we'll go over to my, uh, loft. This is my loft, um, my stack of sheds over the years. There's probably 400-ish in that pile. When I uh, remodeled this room here, I counted when I stacked them and I was in the 360s and I've added a bunch since then. So there's 400, we'll call it. This, uh, this buck here, I shot uh, in 2001. That was my first buck I ever had mounted, nice. Real heavy mass, seven point. Came in uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon. I didn't get a shot at him and I was all bummed out about it. And then three hours later, he did a circle through the swamp and came back out on the ridge that I was hunting and uh, shot him at 30 yards. And he ran about 40 and uh, tipped over. It was uh, pretty excited on that one. This buck here uh, named him Hollywood because it was probably the most uh, photogenic buck that I've ever had. I would literally get hundreds of photos of him. He just knew where every camera I had and he would be on every camera every night, multiple times. Um, shot him October 12th at uh, 7.05 in the evening. He ran about 100 yards and uh, topped over. So next buck, this buck, I nicknamed him Hoss. Um, he's a pretty special deer. 
with him. Uh, I actually found his sheds the year before. He was a four-year-old. He put on 60, or I'm sorry, 45 inches of antler from a three-year-old to a four-year-old. And he, he was really nice three-year-old. Um, just the frame, and I was anxious to see him. And he showed up October 27th for the first time that year, right as they started uh, cutting corn for silage. And uh, once he showed up, he was, he was a regular. Had multiple encounters with him through the year. Um, was actually sitting in my tree stand, and somebody texted me a video or off of Facebook of somebody videoing him dogging along the road. Um, and we were sitting in the stand, and the, the video was posted 20 minutes prior. We're sitting in the stand, and the deer comes running across the field from where the video was filmed. It was a pretty, pretty cool experience. And then uh, I had him come into my big food plot on uh, December 17th, and unfortunately I shot him in the shoulder. And he disappeared for a few weeks, and I actually started feeding about a half a mile away where I found his sheds. And we got a cold snap, and he showed up in broad daylight there. That spot is next to impossible to hunt, so I just stayed out of there. And about three weeks later, we got another cold snap, and he showed back up on the field that uh, I had wounded him on. And I got a second opportunity, and uh, I got my redemption on him. I shot him at 25 yards and uh, double-lunged him, and uh, he's a pretty awesome buck. So... These bucks here, this one is uh, 2019. He came in, this is one of my few deer that I sh have actually shot in November. Almost all my deer I've killed in uh, October in a pretty much a five day window of the October new moon. It's kind of my go-to and I, I highly believe in that moon phase for daylight activity. This buck came in uh, November 11th following a doe. I shot him at 27 yards. He's a seven year old buck. He's Quite a, quite a stud. Uh, this elk I shot in 2019 in New Mexico. Uh, went out and with intentions of, of hopes of shooting something 300 inches or better. We called this bull in and when I first saw him I wasn't going to shoot him and uh, he come walking and I was just, I had a tacticam on my, my bow and I was just going to let him walk by me and I thought it was really cool he was going to walk by me within like 20 yards heading up to my buddy that was calling. And uh, he turned and came around the tree. I was kneeling behind. And from the tip of his nose to me was about six feet when he realized I was knelt there. And uh, he didn't know what I was. And I, the, the Tacticam video is pretty awesome. He whirled, ran 15 yards, stopped, looked back at me, and I couldn't help it anymore. And I, I shot him. He went uh, 50 yards and uh, fell over dead. So. Pretty awesome experience for uh, for elk. This buck here, um, I had uh, several years of experience with with him. One of my, well, actually, he's the only deer in here that I've killed with uh, with a shotgun. Um, I woke up late Wednesday of shotgun season. I bow hunted the previous two days, and uh, I, I was running out the door, and I had sighted in my buddy's shotgun, and I just grabbed it as I was going out the door. And at eight o'clock, he was out in the field with a, a young doe that had come into heat late. And uh, I had him at 85 yards for like 40 minutes and I just couldn't bring myself to shoot him at that distance. I wasn't, it just didn't get me excited. So I let, I decided unless he came into bow range, I, I wasn't gonna take the, the shot. Finally, after about that 40 minute mark, the doe came into the woods and the trail she was on, I knew it would bring him right by me and uh, I shot him at 12 yards. So unfortunately I didn't have my bow with him. Uh, my bear here, this is my first bear I killed in uh, Maine. It uh, was a 225 pound bear. Uh, shot him, what is that, 2009. Pretty cool experience. 
let out a big roar when the arrow hit him. It was pretty awesome. My, my photo collage here, um, always wanted to do this. Just some, you know, really meaningful photos to me. Uh, this bear here, this is my biggest bear. I shot him uh, in West Virginia, actually. A lot of people don't think of West Virginia for big bears, but their, uh, their bear population is actually going through the roof. And uh, it, there's, there's some really nice bears down there. So he was uh, well over 300 pounds and uh, shot him at uh, roughly 20 yards. Next, we'll uh, go downstairs and check out some more of my mounts. So this is my moose. I uh, shot him uh, with a rifle. We were actually bow hunting and we spotted him with, uh, with a cow bedded down from about a mile and a half away. And uh, it took us about three hours to get to him. And uh, when we finally got to him, it was tundra and he was bedded in this like thick, brushy, like island of trees. And all you could see was this one paddle sticking out and we were trying to figure out the last 160 yards, how we were gonna to get to him without getting busted. And uh, in that time, the, the cow had stood up and decided she was hot and wanted to go into the timber. And uh, he got up to leave. And uh, the guide we were with, he, uh, he's like, you can't let that one walk. So he handed me the rifle and I, I tipped him over with the uh, 300 wind mag. Uh, pretty awesome, it, amazing how huge those animals are and definitely, the uh my favorite uh meat of all wild game it's absolutely amazing so next is my my uh wall of fame here i guess so this buck here um i called him the the, the curly brow time 10. he was the first buck that i ever killed using a wireless trail camera i created a uh, watering hole the, the property that I hunted, there was no water on it anywhere. The only water was down in the bottoms, which was on a neighboring farm. And I would always see the deer heading down, you know, in the evenings and, and during the rut, you'd see them going down there to water. So um, there was one spot that uh, was kind of a natural seep. It was always just wet. Uh, so I went in and uh, paid a guy to come in with an excavator, dug out a hole and I lined it to hold water and, uh, this buck uh, started using that water hole in uh, the middle of summer and I put that wireless trail camera on it and it, it, was, it was pretty awesome because previous, you know, I'd have cameras in there and I'd get, you know, deer two, three days at a time in, in daylight. But I, by the time that window had closed, you know, I was already, you know, it was days after and uh, I always hated that. And so I put that cellular camera in there he came in at eight o'clock in the morning, hit the water hole, hit the scrape, and the wind was right for me to sneak in there. I went in that evening and he came out right at last light and uh, stepped into the water hole and I shot him at 25 yards. He ran 40 yards and, and fell over. So he's 157 inches. This buck here is 146 inch eight point. Had uh, he and an, actually this buck came in with a, a third buck. It was the, the most mature deer I've ever had in on me at one time. Those three bucks came in. It was uh, October 12th at uh, seven o'clock in the evening, uh, new moon again. He came in, gave me a 42 yard shot. I hit him a little bit back and high. Um, I was in a ground blind that I had built. And when I came to full draw, I couldn't come to full draw where he was at and my elbow was hitting the back. So I was shooting kind of funky form. And uh, when I touched it off, I hit him back and a little bit high, and he only went like 80 yards and fell in a ditch. Um, real nice, heavy eight point. Uh, this is my 165. I called him trashy, just with all the junk and stuff on his uh, brow tines. I had both of his sheds as well. Um, shot him September 30th, uh, 2012 uh, at uh, 650. If I remember correctly and it again it was the it was my thing is the October new moon I'll keep saying that but this was September but it happened to be the September new moon October new noon with uh, you know September 30th that evening it rained all day and that evening the temperature was supposed to drop uh, 10 degrees the last hour of daylight and it was off and on rain 
Um, I had my buddy there filming me and every time the rain would stop, deer would pile out into the food plot. It would, a torrential downpour would start, they'd pour back into the woods. And uh, we had one really heavy gusty storm hit and cleared the plot and it stopped. And I looked over to my right and he was standing there at uh, 30 yards coming out into the field. He started trotting coming across the field. I grunted at him and uh, shot him at 35 yards. Um, just a beautiful buck. This was my first buck. Uh, I call him my 170, um, but he's 169 and 7 eighths. <laughs> um, awesome deer, again, had uh, a lot of history with him. Uh, shot him October 19th at uh, 5.15 in the evening, actually. Uh, he came in, I had just got in stand, and I had uh, a, a, a spike come in below me. He was coming into a, a group of apple trees, and I had him there, again, October new moon. I had him there the night before, right at last light, and then he came back through that morning just at daybreak and uh, I, I knew I went in at noon and checked cameras that day and I knew I had to be there I got on stand I wasn't there five minutes and I had deer coming in and the spike came up and came pretty much under me and I heard a twig snap and I looked down the hill and it was him he came into about 15 yards stood behind a tree kind of checking things out stepped up into my lane turned to go up into the apple trees I shot him at about 19 yards ran over 40 yards and uh, stopped and uh, tipped over right on camera. So it was pretty awesome. I self filmed that one. It was pretty awesome. Um, this guy right here, 165 inch. This one is my uh, wife's first buck with a compound bow. This buck was running mates with uh, my best buck to date. And he became very predictable. And I told my wife she had to get out in the woods that day. And uh, we made it happen, we go in and it was extremely thick, it had been timbered in there, and I kept hearing a deer walk, and it just sounded like it was just kind of scent checking in the thicket. Uh, he was coming into where we were feeding, which um, is, I don't feel like you can successfully shoot deer over feed all the time, but this guy made himself uh, predictable, and uh, he tried, he couldn't get downwind of us where my stands were, but he was in there circling in the thicket, trying to get downwind of where the feed was. And he then circled back around, came down the logging road, and uh, my wife shot him with her compound at uh, 30 yards. This buck here, I give him the uh, credit for starting my um, October new moon streak. I shot him October 21st at uh, 6 45 in the evening i he kept coming into this little plot that i had and i would see him on the downwind side and he would always just circle back and forth and he busted me twice and uh, so i moved my stand on that side of the field as far as i could and that he came in was trying to circle downwind of where he had busted me pre previously and he just kept zigzagging up back and forth about 40 yards coming up the hill the whole way and he, he it, it was awesome to watch and it felt like it took eternity but he would take like walk up 10 yards he'd walk like 40 yards away from me and then he'd turn and he'd come back towards me and he just did that all the way up the hill just zigzagging scent checking that little plot and then finally he came in and uh, I shot him at 15 yards and he uh he didn't go far at all. So this buck here, um, my wife nicknamed him Doug. He was the one that came in the field. He was a, a three-year-old the year I shot that, that big eight, but he, uh, he came in with that deer uh, the night I shot him. Uh, this buck, is, I shot him uh, November 1st, which happened to be the new moon that year as well, close to October new moon. Um, I, I actually, well, you'll probably, catch a lot of junk for him, but he, he came in with a doe, had decoys out, and the, the doe actually ran into the decoys, and then she took off the opposite direction, and he just stood there at uh, 70 yards, locked on them decoys, and uh, I just, I, I put it to him. I shot him at 70 yards. 
Uh, you can see my lighted knock just uh, streaking across the sky in low light. Um, and uh, he ran uh, about 15 yards just bulldozing, and that was the end of him. The next buck this year, um, my buddy actually let me hunt his property. I shot him uh, January 19th. He ran 120 yards and piled up. The double main beam buck up there, that's, uh, that was my wife's first buck ever. Uh, when she started hunting, she uh, told me that she didn't want to shoot anything unless it was equivalent to what I was killing. So she passed a ton of deer and uh, this buck, I had one, one photo of him in uh, early season in velvet and then a scrape video of him in early uh, October. Um, he showed back up and we got a snowstorm, went into my turnip plot and he came out and it was, it was a pretty awesome video. He's digging and throwing snow and pulling up the big, you know, turnip tops and eating them. It was pretty awesome. And she shot him at 30 yards, he ran about a hundred and uh, that's her first buck. So, um, this buck here is, uh, my pride and joy. I, I called him Sherman, um, had a ton of history with this deer the year before he was a big non-typical. Uh, he had a double main beam on his right side. He lived all summer on about 15 acres. About the time, I think it was uh, September 18th, he disappeared. And uh, I spread my cameras out again, trying to relocate him. And I found him about, about a half a mile away. And uh, I concentrated everything I had on him, trying to figure him out. And right when I felt that I was going to get my shot at, at killing him. He showed up and had his entire beam snapped off just below his brow tine and his double main beam. Um, this photo here on the back is actually of him when he was the non-typical and he snapped it off right there. And oddly enough, shed hunting, you know, you, you figure you had all that antler laying out there, shed hunting, the only piece of antler that I found was the base that, to his broken off thing. And I actually had stepped over it twice, but I was shed hunting and it was raining and I was going the opposite direction on this trail that I had walked previously and the white pedicle caught my eye. And uh, so I incorporated that into the base and I built this base for him. Um, this deer, the, the next year obviously grew a more typical frame. He's uh, just shy of 180 inches. Oddly enough, well not oddly enough, but he jumped right back on to the same exact pattern that I figured out the year before where he was betting on the neighboring property coming across the saddle and going up into the oaks in the evening. The night I killed him, he, uh, well, to back up, that Monday we had, uh, it rained all day. It was supposed to stop at four o'clock in the evening and uh, I got it into the farm at four and it had just stopped right when I pulled in the drive and uh, got changed. I'm walking into my stand and I'm hitting deer, I'm bumping deer and I'm, I'm really just aggravated with it because I, I, I felt like I was behind, you know, I needed to be in there 30 minutes earlier, but I couldn't. And uh, I get in the stand and at five o'clock, I look across that reclaimed field. And so this story, this is where the story gets good. So. I told my buddy that I wanted to hunt that stand I missed him out of because I can see that entire neighboring property where he's bedding. And I felt like, you know, I, I could see if he's still in the area, if he was moving anywhere, I could see, literally see like 70 acres of reclaim. And uh, I said, my only fear is if he does come back through that saddle, he's going to circle even further downwind of where I spooked him if he came through there. And I said, but it had rained all day. and. If he does, and I can see him heading downwind or through that draw, and I know how they come through that draw, and when they hit that little island of trees, how they circle up through there, I could get down and switch stands. And that's exactly how I killed him. I saw him in the bottom, checking a scrape line. He's coming up the scrape line, he hit a scrape, hit a second scrape, and at that point, he could go two ways. He could go back up to that field where he, I saw him the, the previous two times, or he can continue up the draw and uh, go into that island of trees. And if he did that, that would bring him, the way they circle around that, it would bring him straight downwind of the stand I was in. 
So when he left that second scrape and committed to coming through that draw, I grabbed my bow and I climbed down. And when I got two steps off the ground, I could still look down in the bottom and he's 250 yards away, just slowly walking up that draw. I hit the ground, I sprint about 85 yards, get up in another stand that I had on the other side of that draw. And I sit there and I, like, I'm panting, I'm out of breath. My, my adrenaline's ru rushing, you know, cause I knew he was going to come up. He had to come up through there. It's just a natural funnel. And, uh, I sat there for about 15 minutes and I started hearing things. Most of it's psychological. And, uh, I, I thought it sounded like a deer just slowly stepping as it was feeding on acorns, but there's a hickory tree right there. I couldn't see through it. And my attention is focused right here. And, uh, I'm sitting there and for whatever reason I look up and he's standing there right on the edge of the, that lane broadside looking at the stand that I previously was sitting in and he would have been 35 yards downwind of that stand. So I made the right choice, but he was 57 yards. So I ranged him. I, I was shooting a single pin. I set it to 57 yards. I drew back and I, after missing him, I focused. That was probably the most focus I've ever put on a shot in my life. And I touched it off and he mule kicked. He ran 20 yards and stopped just inside the tree line. And as soon as he stopped, I knew I had him and he tipped over right there. Probably one of the, the greatest moments of my life. That hunt was just amazing. Everything about it, the history with him just, he, he was an amazing deer. And when I got down, I walked up on him and uh, I just sat down on a log and stared at him for about five minutes before I even touched him. So pretty amazing deer. So that, uh, that pretty much concludes the, uh, the list of deer in my house. So uh, you, uh, you don't have to go home, but uh, you can't hunt here. <laughs>